talking about partnerships in sport for development. Earlier on in this course, we looked at the broad architecture of the key players um, that were real drivers in the whole field of sport for development. So they included the United Nations, the International Platform for Sport and Development, um, Beyond Sport, among others. So these agencies not only uh, facilitate information transfer across organizations, knowledge, research, uh, funding, um, uh, they're really a bridge uh, to enhance inter-organizational interactions among all of the organizations. And as we've seen the growth in sport for development over the last decade or so, um, we've seen organizations develop umbrella agencies um, if they have a common sport. For example, there's an umbrella agency um, for rugby organizations that deliver rugby for development programs. And just one great reason for this would be to attract sponsors. So if you have one sport for development organization with maybe a thousand kids, it might not be as attractive to a corporate partner if you had 60 or 70 sport for development organizations and then you're looking at 50 or 60,000 children that are participating and that you can offer that branding, websites, etc. in terms of the activation. So what we're going to speak to today is an overview of partnerships, why organizations should partner, but also also, there's a bit of a paradox of partnerships, so it's not always a win-win, and I don't want you to come away from today's lecture and, and think that, you know, everything about partnerships is great. Uh, it's a little bit like our panacea is. We have to be realistic when we look at partnerships as well. So we're just going to take a moment and define a partnership. So that's an inter-organizational relationship that has um, an element of trust, loyalty, and continuity. Um, usually there's some type of uh, cohesiveness in terms of the goals of the organization um, that brings them together. They're trying to achieve the same thing and I think we very much see that in sport for development. Um, Partnerships uh, provide organizations with a tremendous amount of stability and we've seen a growth in partnerships because many of the funding agencies, so if you went to UNICEF uh, or Beyond Sport or the Lorenz uh, Foundation and asked for funding, one of the first things in your application form would be who are your partners because they know that the longevity of your organization and the efforts that you're trying to undertake in terms of the issue or the aid that you're providing, um, it's much more likely that you'll be able to achieve that if you're not a, a sole uh, organization that's working exclusively on your own. Partnerships are also critical to attaining resources. And here, we're looking at tangible resources, so that might be um, equipment, it might be sending trainers down, uh, it might be someone helping you to uh, recruit um, more people into your schools, uh, it might be you know principals. We mentioned a lot in our Turks and Caicos in terms of the diversity of partnerships that we had right down from the government uh, to the PE teachers. So all of those individuals and uh, organizations are key partners um, that help facilitate in terms of providing resource and that resource can certainly be access to the school and the children. Um, there are also um, uh, communication uh, resources that are available. We've mentioned funding that's absolutely critical. Um, then we'll touch a little bit on the intangible resources that are available. And I think that right away when people think about, okay, I'm going to go out and get a partner, they're thinking about, you know, I need money. And so, you know, the most important thing that I can have right now is bringing money in. And I'm not saying that that's not important, especially if you're a fledgling sport for development organization. But there are other elements that might be way more important. So one of them is legitimacy. And I think you saw that early on in Oliver's uh, article, that if you are seen to have partners that are highly legitimate organizations, that helps you attract other partners. So if you're linked to UNICEF, if you're linked to Nike, if you're linked to, the, if you've been awarded, um, you know, a prize from the Lorenz Foundation or Beyond Sport, that means that these other external organizations have sort of given you that tap of approval to say um, that you are worth partnering with and the 
program that you're offering um, is, is achieving its goals. Um, so legitimacy is absolutely key. Um, and then networking opportunities. So once you're part of this broader, you know, sort of framework of organizations, so if you're part of the Beyond Sport or the International Framework for Sport for Development, if you attend conferences, if you undertake that networking, then you're meeting people that also provide you with open doors to other partners that they may have. As I mentioned with the rugby, why not join that umbrella organization and have access access to their partners that help to deliver their programs. Government agencies can also be fundamental. As we mentioned, uh, CEDA, a branch of Canada, the Canadian International Development Agency, um, but governments also provide legitimacy, they provide funding, they can open other doors. Um, when we uh, went as part of the Canada Caribbean Institute um, for our first uh, symposium in Jamaica last year, um, it was incredible how many people were there from international economic development agencies and they were talking broadly about um, economic development that Canada can help facilitate in uh, the Caribbean countries. We also had um, the High Commissioner uh, for um, uh, Jamaica attended several of our sessions and gave a keynote presentation. So, and again, not only does it help legitimacy, that helps us open doors to the government agencies that operate in those Caribbean countries. So, you know, having someone who can make that phone call and say, will you sit down and, and meet with X from, you know, the Sport for Development organization. It might be pushing your uh, application a little bit further uh, through because because you know somebody or helping to address further resource needs um, because you have someone that can make that phone call. We also found that in the Turks and Caicos, so the head of the Turks and Caicos rugby football uh, organization that we were working with, um, Keith um, uh, Barante, was just incredibly well known in the Turks and Caicos, and he could literally pick up the phone and set up an appointment for us with the Minister of Sport. Um, so having that type of access was really key in terms of us being able to then access other people to achieve our goals. Partnerships also help you overcome the what they call the adversarial relationship of dealing with organizations in an open marketplace. So if you need to have access to maybe it's sporting equipment um, for your program, you can look out on an open market. Um, you can scan for the best prices, the best quality, and ensuring delivery and access, and the, obviously the the type of equipment that you need in the volume that you need and in the time frame that you need. Um, and you can scout that out, but it might take days, months, goodness knows how much time to, you know, find that resource. And then every year you're continually to look at that. And then when you find someone who can provide exactly what you're looking for, then you're negotiating over price. So that's what why we talk about the, the buyer and seller adversarial issues. Because of course, the seller wants the highest price and the buyer wants the lowest price. And so, you know, you kind of have this stall um, in the relationship. So often when you can strike up a partnership, so maybe you find someone that can provide that resource that you need, again, at the price, the quantity, quality, uh, timing, delivery, et cetera, that you need, you might say to them, you know, um, uh, you know we'll, we'll pay you for those, uh, the soccer balls or footballs or whatever it is that you need, um, but we're also gonna put you on our website. Um, we're going to provide you with signage. Um, we're going to um, have a keynote speaker come to your organization's uh, annual conference this year or pr put a, an interview with you on our website so people know that we're associated with you. So there's lots of things that you can do to move that you know, adversarial price only exchange relationship to more of a partnership where both are um, benefiting from the relationship. And again, these partnerships they involve more and more and more over time as you begin to identify different ways that you can help each other. So something that might start out really small like a, a sponsorship um, and, and you're purchasing something for them or maybe they're going to you know put an ad in their uh, newsletter of their organization or encourage some of their members 
to fund um, your support for development organization, um, you know, that might grow over time. So the idea is that when you're looking at the different organizations that you're interacting with, that you're trying to move those towards that partnership relationship. Um, and then you're not every single year having to run around and try to gain access to those footballs again and going through that entire process. Um, so certainly, um, you know, partnerships hold several advantages um, over purely exchange relationships where you're buying uh, resources on an open market. Organizations like Coaches Across Continents or the Rwanda Football uh, League, these organizations, uh, when they partner, um, they're looking not necessarily, again, at those tangible resources, it's more of those intangible resources that are really important. So the first one is um, uh, adaptive learning. So when the two organizations begin together, work together, then their, um, you know, staff or volunteers are, are ex uh, just um, through a fluid nature going through this knowledge transfer process. Each one is learning from the other. Um, so you're not out there isolated all alone having to recreate the wheel with every single program that you learn. When you partner with another organization, then you gain access to the knowledge that they have and that's transferred just by way of maybe uniform program delivery or inviting someone to come. give a guest seminar or a coaching uh, clinic for your athletes, but you've also got all of your coaches who are going to be there and watching that and gaining that insight and that, that knowledge. So we have adaptive learning, and as you sort of heard from my previous statement, that's related to knowledge transfer. But here, um, organizations need to be very purposeful when we're thinking about some of these intangible types of resources that you're accessing. So you should have as a meaningful um, part of a conversation or an interaction that you're having, what knowledge am I actually gaining from this organization? So right now I've been engaged, you'll see her interview with Tiana Wiggins as one of our industry experts and she operates um, a program that uh, provides youth with industry internships in Barbados with the hopes that they'll stay in school and it might be anything from hairdressing to um, uh, I think there were a lot of kids that were in the automotive uh, some in tourism um, and trying to teach, the, teach these kids hard skills but every time I meet with her you know I can ask questions about you know how did you recruit your industry experts how did you choose which, which industries were going to be the most important important for your children? Um, how did you actually recruit the kids into the program? What were the main factors that really compelled the kids when they chose the different industry opportunities that were available to them? So every time we have a conversation with different people that are running different programs, there are opportunities to share knowledge. You need to be very specific about attaining that knowledge. So going into that meeting with a list of questions and things that you really want to gain and learn when you actually sit down and meet with these people who are delivering the programs because they're unbelievable resources to you. Curriculum development um, is also very fluid within understanding key elements of sport for development curricula um, across different programs. Um, so what you'll find is that um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time you want to maybe achieve a goal or understand different ways that you can use sport and games and play um, as teaching mechanisms. So Tyler Collimore is the founder of United Play and if I contacted Tyler and said, you know, there's this fledgling sport for development organizations that's trying to do, you know, economic development through sport tourism in the Caribbean and they're looking at games to teach people how to um, you know run tournaments can you uh, can we use have access to your games he would say yes instantly so and many of the organizations have placed their their information online um, because they want others to have access to it so there's this overall belief and goal in development and helping others 
that really surrounds the community and support for development. So you don't necessarily need to reinvent all of the fundamentals of your curriculum. You can reach out to others and I think that's another benefit of having that umbrella rugby organization because some might have some really amazing ways that they're using rugby to teach different facets. Of course it's different in every community in terms of their issues and their needs but there might be innovations that are available and being part of the international platform for sport for development or beyond sport or reaching out to organizations like Right to Play or um, uh, United Play, these there are people there who are resources that will help you either modify a curriculum, um, adapt a curriculum, or use their fundamental uh, um, knowledge that they have uh, to work with you to maybe come up with some new ideas. I do not see a lot of proprietary behavior within the field of sport for development. I see a lot of collaboration, again, because of that overall goal achievement um, cohesiveness that we see across the field. Opportunities to learn how to use different techniques to actually deliver programs are often um, you know very accessible through the field. Um, so it's interesting how there might be a coach or someone wanting to offer a, a clinic, um, a senior rugby uh, individual who wants to come and certify your athletes so that they can um, go on and coach the younger uh, children. And it's amazing how these individuals are so willing to give of their time and their knowledge and their expertise to come and show you the best way to deliver these programs. So certainly those delivery techniques, how to organize, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, setting up the different games or organizing, you know, for us, um, it was amazing when before we went to the Turks and Caicos Island to deliver the rugby program, the students selected for that program was mainly because of their experience with children. Right? I didn't really know if you care if you could play rugby. That was really beneficial. But if you had no experience with children, then that was a little bit problematic because I'm putting you in a school, you know, and then all day you're delivering a program to, you know, 30, 40, 50 kids, you know, different kids every hour. So if you haven't had some experience working with kids, um, then that was a bit of an issue. So we chose the students that, that really enjoyed kids, worked with kids, knew how to work with kids and programs. And then I thought, okay, I could teach you the rugby part of that. So I contacted uh, Canada Rugby and Ontario Rugby, and, and they sent a rugby uh, individual to certify all of our students in the fundamentals of rugby for free. And, and they did a story about our program on their website. They were so excited about how we were using rugby to achieve these, these goals in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, they gave us uh, booklets that we could take down, tons of, um, they were like play cards um, that you could use that had different skills and drills. And then our students could adapt those to integrate the key messages that we were trying to deliver as part of our, you know, this was a plus sport, right? So they were giving us tons of the sport part of that, and then we would integrate the plus into that. So it was really amazing how terrific they were. So, you know, that pro those program delivery techniques are readily available, and in my experience, people are very willing to share their expertise. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and share some information about some partnerships with you. I'm going to speak to them now, but information will also be available to you on Sakai. So one partnership that I think the magnitude um, and the uh, impact um, really, you know, uh, drove me to share information about this partnership. So it's the Australia Sport Pacific Partnership, and it's largely largely funded by the Australia government um, but they also work with 16 different national sport organizations in nine Caribbean nations and they've delivered the program to over 350,000 children so imagine the collaboration integration funding 
um, delivery of those funds, access to resources, knowledge sharing, imagine all of those things going on as you work in nine different countries for goal achievement. There are three main goals of the partnership. The first is to address the factors associated with non-communicable diseases. The second one is to um, really enhance opportunities for girls and women. And the third one really focuses on individuals with disabilities. Um, the next partnership is interesting because of its longevity. So it's 20 years old. It was founded in 2001 with, again, the really ambitious goal of teaching every single child in uh, Leo um, how to play the sport of rugby. So the main partners within the context of the partnership are the Ministry of Education and Sport, um, Asia Rugby and World Rugby. The Lao Rugby Program has grown from 300 students to over 3,000 students in 12 different villages. Um, key partners in this were the men's and women's uh, rugby programs in the country of Laos. Um, and what they did was they reached out to the um, Olympic Committee and through the Olympic Committee they were um, able to bring in the Olympic Solidarity Coach Training Program which then is continues to be extended throughout the different um, villages um, on an ongoing uh, basis and certainly you'll see that in the video. Um, so one of the key elements of the program is to teach the children life skills through rugby. Um, and their goal is that every single child, especially in some key economically and, and uh, disadvantaged areas of rugby, uh, where the kids might not even have access to proper hygiene, um, have this life skills program that's delivered to them in a really fun way where they also get some exercise and fitness um, through, the, uh, through the rugby program. Um, something that's really interesting is that 57% of the participants, participants in the program are young girls and women. Um, the other key element is that they have a program where they try to um, engage um, the participants in the program to follow through with the training um, to become coaches and leaders or managers of the program. So the skill development extends far beyond just the initial life skills um, that they were trying to develop. At the start of today's lecture, I mentioned that partnerships are not panaceas, that there can also be some key limitations. So um, I refer to these as the paradox of partnerships. And uh, what I mean by paradox is that it, it's, while it looks really, really great, there are also key limitations. Okay, so with partnerships, um, yes, they're a way to gain access to resources and knowledge, um, but they take an incredible amount of time, not only to initiate those relationships, but then to manage those relationships. So for a really small sport for development organization, you might need someone who's, you know, 100% of their time is dedicated to manage these relationships, and you just might not have someone that has the skills to do that, or the time to do that. So that expenditure of human resources on the management and the recruitment of partnerships um, can be a huge limitation, um, especially for a fledgling sport for development organization. Um, with all organizations, continuity is really critical. However, you don't really know when a partnership might cease to be engaged, when they might stop their funding, uh, when they might move on to another organization because there's maybe just been a different in, difference in terms of goal coherence. So that lack of stability um, can be really challenging unless you can lock in those partnerships to a certain, you know, maybe a five year uh, time period period where you've both agreed that you'll stay together and again that provides you with that continuity for not only program delivery but also to um, let other partners know that you've got this uh, solid group of organizations that are working together over time. A final limitation of the partnerships is that once you engage with other organizations it means that you lose some of your decision-making authority because you're now having to maybe check with your partner if you want 
wanted to make a, a fundamental change in your organization, maybe if you wanted to introduce a new partner, a new funding partner. Um, another issue is exclusivity, and of course we see that across sport, but one example of this that's really quite relevant to sport for development is that Right to Play had um, an automobile sponsorship, um, but that automobile company was different from the one that um, was with the 2010 Olympics. So Right to Play had always been invited into the Athletes Village where they would recruit athletes to be their athlete ambassadors, but because they had a different automobile partnership, um, the Vancouver 2010 Olympics told them they weren't allowed to come onto the grounds. So there was a huge upheaval because people loved Right to Play um, and uh, the actual car company actually offered to, to say, you, you can still have the money, but you don't have to use our logos in what you're doing but right to play said no um, you know we're not going to back down we're going to support this um, so they ended up coming up with sort of a unique um, arrangement where right to play was allowed to have a tent um, out with some of the other um, booths and things that were um, still on the official uh, grounds of the 2010, Olymp 2010 Olympic Games but they weren't in the athletes uh, village but they still hosted athletes forums and I believe that they were uh, able to to achieve their goals but here having one partner might limit your opportunity to have other partners because of the nature of exclusivity so you need to be very well aware of that there are ways that you can overcome the paradox of partnerships the first is to have a decentralized organizational structure so you might have a partner that comes to you with an opportunity you need to be able to respond to that right away so instead of having to have all of the decisions go to the top of the hierarchy of your organization organization, maybe the CEO or founder, delegate that responsibility to the person that's actually managing that relationship so they can make the decisions in a really timely manner. And, and part of that is having an organizational culture that facilitates collaboration. So across every level of the organization, you're embracing the notion of partnerships. People are continually looking for ways to leverage the partnerships, but also to provide new opportunities for the partnership to be further engaged and, and leverage their relationship with you to achieve their organizational goals. So that's really key. Um, again, you know, back to the you know issue of managing the partnerships, you need to dedicate someone either full-time or an extensive amount of their time is dedicated to managing the relationships because as soon as you don't return the phone calls, don't return the emails, don't provide something that was promised to the partner, you're going to lose that partner. And think about the amount of time that you've and energy that you've put into establishing that relationship and here you're losing all all of the benefits that you have with that so you know establish someone to have who's actually going to manage it um, have a real willingness in the organization to share resources. You can't be, well, this is mine and this is yours. It needs to be, we're working together to achieve these goals. And so this idea of resource sharing, whether it's staff, knowledge, um, uh, you know, training manuals, um, you know, inviting, um, maybe you have a high performance athlete that's coming into your program, you know, maybe sharing that with the, um, the other partner as well in terms of maybe um, you know, a corporate, um, you know, commercial or something that they wanted to do. So it's, you know, just this whole idea of, you know, we're working together and we're sharing. Um, and then the final one is that, you know, when you think about partnerships, it's not about the bottom line. And by that, I mean, the partnerships are not about bringing money into your organization. Yes, it's fantastic to have a partner that would actually, you know, do a marketing sponsorship um, for you and provide you with some funding. But there are tons of other relationships that will provide, if not the same, but much more meaningful benefits for your organization. Now that you have a better understanding of the value of partnerships, but also the paradox of partnerships, this gives you an opportunity to move forward, to choose the partners that fit with the goals of your organization, to identify the resources that you need and which organizations will best give them to you, how to make sure that you're best managing those relationships so that you can um, establish a time frame for the relationship and then keep those 
those partners over the duration of that time. And you've seen a couple of really great examples of uh, partnerships that have achieved some pretty fantastic uh, goals. So thanks very much for listening to today's lecture and make sure that you click onto the other URLs and read about the other examples that will be shared with you on Sakai.